Hey, I'm first. So welcome everyone um, to the first, and hopefully of many, uh, Twitch dev meetups for the community. Uh, <laughs> and we're here today to do a couple of talks. Um, I can't remember which button it is. I think it's that one. Hey, there we go. So firstly, we've got me for a few minutes, uh, just talking about last year, the last year, and see what's uh, happening in the future. Then we've got Blink, our gracious hosts, who are going to do a little talk uh, for us as well. Uh, we then have Eric, Talk To Me Gooseman, doing his talk on a little bit of architecture. Eric, uh, his architecture talk and lessons learned. And then we have Bressy, or Bryce, um, doing his why your extension doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, it could have been just Bryce just talking for a couple of hours, but uh, we decided not to do that. Um, and then we were going to do giveaways and stuff. We got that swag at the front door. We'll just sort of start chucking it out of here, if that's all right. Um, <laughs> Uh, and any Q&A stuff, and we'll try and get that done at the end. So, what happened in 2019? Or the end of 2018 as well? V5, <laughs> V3 is gone. Uh, V5 is still there, just about. And it will be for the foreseeable future, so we'll see how long that lasts. Um, until we get, hopefully, pretty much the parity. I'm looking at Matt over here, he's just eating. <laughs> we are just going to get all the uh, API stuff, aren't we? <laughs> or is it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that's that's ongoing. Still going to be V5 is going to be here for a while, I would guess. Uh, then we had the Twitch Dev Discord, which has been amazing. Uh, the shutdown of the Twitch servers for chat and stuff like that, where we were using the Twitch app, that is gone. And the uh, cricket gave us the Discord server. And in that year, we're at 3,000 plus members. 3,300 plus. Uh, I think in the time I did this presentation, it's gone up to the 3,400. And the biggest actual channel on there is Extension Help, uh, which is why we've got a chat on it today. <laughs> I think it's got. <laughs> that channel has got about 80% of all the messages on that server. <laughs> so there's a reason why we do talks about extensions. The Twitch Dev Weekly streams have been a thing and increased amazingly. Uh,
test. That's better there. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, we have audio, and I'm sorry for the stream if you missed most of that. Um, it was very funny, and people were laughing. <laughs> Honest. Uh, and again, shout out to the admins and mods on the Twitch Dev Discord. They've been great throughout this whole year, basically. Um, and yes, I am one of them. Um, <laughs> Shameless plug. Oh, and cricket for setting up. Now let's see if the next one goes on. There you go. That comment is very well known to one person. That one. <laughs> <laughs> Barry has been keeping the forum going for like so long, just like <laughs> taking people straight to help as soon as they get on there um, with their can't log into my account. Uh, forum posts. He was going to be doing a talk today. Unfortunately, he doesn't land for another half an hour. <laughs> and then we're going to move on to the bit of community stuff. Now, I can't remember what we, I've actually put on this slide. Hey, there we go, live coders. So there's a few here in this uh, room who are part of a stream team called the Live Coders, who's run by C Sharp Fritz. And if you want to go and join that team, we've got like an application form and you can sort of get in there. But I think we're up to 80 plus members at the moment. Um, and we all do live coding, doesn't matter what language, whatever. It's just a great ethos to just get code out there and get people coding. Uh, we're sort of organizing a few events for the near future, so watch that space. And Twitch Dev, as a community, just growing exponentially. You're all here. We sold out today. Uh, that was amazing. I wasn't expecting it, uh, to be honest. There's the Discord, the forum, and then the hackathon this week, uh, this weekend. And also there's the Dev Jam going on at the moment for extensions. Uh, I am doing something for that, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> Spoiler. Uh, there's the Dev Jam. And then my shout outs. Here we go. What have we got? Blink. Thanks, Brent, for organizing it with Eric. Twitch, again, for supplying the catering. And Whole Health Catering for cooking us the food. <laughs> Thank you. Eric for being my San Diego contact and dealing <laughs> again and dealing with the seven hour time zone that I was behind him, <laughs> uh, in front of him. Uh, and Barry being f fashionably late. Um, so we'll see if he actually does turn up. And me. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I think that's it. So, what, lucky number 11? Lucky number 11. Um, so, what we've got now is we have Blink with Matt Kissick with his talk. And uh, come on, come on, Matt. I'm just going to let the uh, master of ceremony, Brent, get this uh, all switched over. Still trying to master the uh, the two screen thing. Okay, perfect. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Kizik. I'm a user experience designer with Blink. I'm in our uh, San Francisco studio, but we're super excited to have you here at our San Diego studio. Um, 
So for those of you who don't know, uh, Blink is a UX design and research firm. And what we do is, it's awesome. <laughs> we, uh, we like to work with fantastic companies, and we like to create great products, experiences, and uh, concepts. And in this case, I'm going to talk to you about a concept uh, that we worked on for Atari VCS. Um, and I'm going to walk you through kind of the uh, overall process we, we went through to help them set up a North Star or just kind of a, a, a target to try to hit for a conceptual UI. And this, of course, is for their um, upcoming console the, uh, or foray back into the uh, living room with the Atari VCS. I'm going to see if this clicker works. <gasps> it does. OK, cool. So Atari um, asked us to create an evocative new interface that honors Atari's rich history while moving it in an exciting modern direction. Great. What does that mean? Um, <laughs> so the idea behind this is they came to us looking for a bit of help to figure out um, what the, uh, the GUI or the graphical user interface or basically what you see on the TV for this console could be and how we could kind of push those limits for a company that was kind of rediscovering themselves. We all know Atari from the past, the 2600, pretty much the pioneers of video gaming. Um, but what does a new Atari look like, and how can we honor that past while not just, you know, copy-pasting it? So we had the Atari team to our studio in San Francisco, and we got things started with a workshop. Um, and workshops are one of my favorite things because they're a great way of just getting a dialogue started and trying to figure out, try to figure out what people are thinking and things they may not know how to say, but know how to maybe express with a dot or a word or an image. So a couple of workshop techniques that we went through um, really helped us set up our design tenets, or basically, what are we going to look back to when we're designing this to figure out, is this the right thing? Is this the right direction we're going for? And is this from the voice of our client, Atari? So one of the ones we did was uh, basically picking words. So we had a huge amount of descriptive words, and we asked the client to kind of go through and pick out words that they felt best represented what they imagined this product to be. Um, and especially ones they imagined it wasn't. So, you know, words that we should totally avoid. And what this really helped us do is as we started designing and as we started putting screens together and putting experiences together, we could look back at them and go, you know, is this, does it, is this uh, let's say a word was ambitious, let's say. I know that's one up there. Is this ambitious? No, it seems a little safe. Okay, let's try something a little more risky, right? Let's be a little more ambitious. That's just an example. I don't think that was actually one of the words, but it's on the screen. Um, and then one of my favorite ones is something called continuums. And what I really like about this is, you know how sometimes there's a lot of people in a room, sometimes it's tough for everyone to have a voice. And I think what's great about workshops is it really levels that playing field, you know? So continuums is basically putting two very different words next to each other. It's hard to talk if I move my hands to the mic. Um, so an example would be like retro, futuristic, right? So that's one of the ones we had on there. And a lot of the time, you get everyone putting a dot on one side, and you go, perfect, this is, this is the path we're going down. But what I love is sometimes you'll get four people with a dot on one side, and you get that one dot all the way on the other side. And that might be something, that, uh, something uh, that someone feels really strongly for, or maybe something that after a while they might go, oh, you know what, maybe not, my dot needs to go on the other side. But what I love about that is for the people that may not have a voice, they can really express what they feel just by putting that dot on that continuum. And it really started a lot of great dialogues. We had really good discussions because someone would put something that was slightly contrasting to somebody else, and we'd go, okay, well, what do you, what do you think about that? Like, why did you put that there, and why is that so different? And it, it started a dialogue, and it pulls a lot of quotes. And we got some really great quotes out of it. And I'll show you one that I loved. You also see just on the back, we've got tons of images. So we actually pulled kind of our whole Blink studios. So we've got studios in Seattle, San Francisco, San Diego, Austin, Boston. And we said, post images, post motion studies that you feel are like great inspiration for video games or futuristic or whatever you want. Just post things that when you think Atari, what would you put up there? And we, put them up on the wall so when the client walked in, they're like, oh my god, look at all these images. Um, and we had them pick images off the wall. And, you know, they'd describe them, say what they felt about them, why they picked them. And they'd also pick ones that they thought were terrible. And they go, don't do this. This is horrible. Put this aside. I never want to see this ever again, which is great as well because we know what to avoid. Last thing you want to do is when you go into your like, first client reviews to show them something that they absolutely hate. So they picked a couple images for us. Oop, I'm going to go back. And these are some of the images that um, really resonated with them. You're going to notice a lot of depth here, use of light, 
obviously the Atari from uh, Blade Runner as a classic. Um, they love that. But depth and this kind of retro futurism were definitely something that came out from that. And so that was a great inspiration for us to start designing. But one of my favorite things is the quote that we got from this, um, from the client, which was, it should feel like it felt and not try to look the way it looked then. Again, like I said, we don't want to copy paste this thing, but like, how do you honor the tradition of such a huge company that has such a storied past when it comes to video games without you know, just completely reusing it? Not to mention, it's also a company that's never really had an interface, right? So what does that interface look like? How do you put together an interface for a company that was largely in an era when that wasn't a thing? And especially for a company where we didn't have a lot of assets. You know, you have the coveted Fuji logo for Atari, and then you've got a lot of great imagery from the past. I'll get that into that in a little bit, but that's kind of where we started going to, is we looked at the past and we went, okay, well, what can we do with this? But first we put together a really kick-ass team. Um, so we really wanted to cover all grounds for this. And we were putting together a, like, basically a working sort of prototype where you could kind of walk through it. So we wanted to cover all bases. So we had myself, user experience designer, and my job really uh, you know, involves looking at how someone goes through an experience. Why would someone click there? What happens after that? What's that user journey? We had Josh, who was an amazing visual designer, who helped us capture, what does that look like? What does this future UI look like? Kuba, amazing motion designer. You can't really show an interface without showing how it moves, how it feels, right? That's so much a part of it. You know, when you kind of move on a joystick and you, you have that feeling of moving around, that's, that's an important bit. We had some great oversight as well, too, from our creative officer, strategy officer, a fantastic project manager, and Lance, who was very much involved in the, uh, the client relations side of things. So like I mentioned, we looked at the past. Um, we didn't have a lot at our disposal. So, this is a great book that we look to a lot called The Art of Atari, and it's full of just amazing images from both their branding, their marketing, uh, both conceptual, both um, you know, things that you saw on the box art. And one thing we found really cool about Atari games, and just kind of about video games in general, and I'm sure all of you can kind of relate to this, is it's kind of that feeling of being transported, right? You look at the box art, for instance, for um, an Atari game like this, or like um, Centipede, for instance. And if you've ever actually played Centipede, it's a bunch of boxes on the screen, and it looks absolutely nothing like this, right? But it feels like this. And so that's kind of what we went with. We started considering these ideas of this nostalgia and going back to those roots, but celebrating that rich kind of wonder and wow of playing a video game. I remember the first time I picked up my babysitter's uh, Super Nintendo, and I went, this is it. This is the peak of graphical games. It'll, it'll never get better than this. Yeah, like the boxes from like uh, GoldenEye. That was perfect. It's not anymore. <laughs> so yeah, so we, we started looking at that, and then one image that came up a lot that we felt was super cool was this one. This was for some HBO promo that they did, uh, like that HBO did in the past. But, we really loved um, these spaces. And we called this a dollhouse, and then eventually started talking about portals. Um, and the concept we started building around was this idea of being transported into a game or transporting into a portal. You know, when you put that cartridge in and you press play and whoosh, you're in, you're starting the experience, right? And you're kind of just, you're lost, you're into that world. So this also ties a little bit to some of the imagery we saw them pick, right? They talked a lot about depth. They talked a lot about color and brightness. So that's really a big thing that instigated this, is we're like, okay, cool. How do we take that depth? How do we create that feeling of wonder and nostalgia? And that's where these ideas of portals kind of came from. So I'm going to show you now is a very, like, it's uh, basically teasing you with this, um, showing you basically what they've shown on their, their blog already, because this is a concept. So they're taking this, they're going to work with this, and they're going to create a product out of it. So none of this is final. But um, it's going to give you an idea of the intro and the load-in. And some things to look out at is we're trying to call back to the past, but kind of have a slightly futuristic, you know, welcome to the modern era as you jump in. And you're going to see a little hint of those portals and those boxes in the load-in. And then uh, it is going to cut off, and you're going to feel like I've totally gypped you. Terrible, right? Just absolutely teases you. You're like, oh my god. 
I know, right? So I'll talk to you a little more about it, though, and talk to you about what happens after this. Um, so these are the portals loading, and the idea is each of these are going to be a portal with a game. And what we want to do is each game would have its own unique color, own unique feel, and own assets as well. So it's kind of a 3D space, and as you navigate through it, there's a sense of depth and a sense of what's beyond this, right? And as you enter a game, it whew, rushes you into this space, and you're, you're into a space where you can celebrate that game. So for Centipede, there's beautiful Centipede images and the ability to play, but then you can scroll down and look at videos of gameplay. You can look at previous uh, illustrations from the past. So for these older games, we really wanted to celebrate that, that illustration. But you also know for a lot of these newer games, there's a lot of assets. You see a lot of assets that go into creating a game. So we wanted to go, well, where's the place to celebrate that? Let's show off all this great art. Um, similarly, for things like apps or anything like that, you could really dive in and just feel like you're, oh, I'm in there, I'm ready to go. And you'll notice at the start, probably one of my favorite parts is that load in. We have this idea of basically making that Fuji logo pop up, but giving a slightly random startup each time. So in that case, it was Asteroids, but you can maybe have Joust or Centipede or something like that that would appear. And it's, you know, I love the idea of the, you know, you can think of, you can think of the console that you had. You can usually think of that startup, right? For it, you go, oh, there it goes, ready to go. I remember probably the, original Xbox startup, it's going like, to trigger memories for me. But that same sort of idea, we wanted to make it kind of random and fun. Um, so yeah, so we put this together, gave it to the client, they loved it. We provided design assets, we provided um, a lot of information on how to make these boxes too, because we knew it had to, had to be developed. Um, so Kuba, our fantastic motion and um, 3D designer, put together a great list of how the lighting works, how the depth works, and all these sort of assets. And we really tried to get it to a point where it was as achievable as possible, as minim minimal triangles in it, so it wasn't over-rendered or anything like that. And uh, we're super stoked with the results. Um, we're super excited to see what they do with it. Um, and I'm sorry I can't show you more, but I hope it excites you <laughs> and uh, starts making you ask questions about what you know the future of a interface could look like. Um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you. So next we've got uh, Eric, or Talk to Me Guzman, with his uh, architecture chart. So we'll just get that sorted, and he'll be on in a second. All right. Okay. So, hey everyone. <laughs> Eric, talk to me, Goose Man. Um, so I am. I was the Barry bench warmer. So I, sent, once we figured out Barry couldn't uh, come in and do a talk, I had to cobble together something. So we'll see how this goes. Um, yeah. Apparently, apparently, I added too many slides, but we'll see how things how things go. Uh, so yeah. So uh, building extensions, uh, architecture lessons learned sometimes the hard way. So, uh, so I have a number of extensions that I built on the App Store. So uh, the GitHub Projects extension, Better Information Panel, uh, Stream Teams extension, uh, Stream CC, and then just a small uh, uh, hashtag Go Vote just to make people aware about going going to vote. I'm going to talk about four of these extensions, not the go, hashtag Go Vote. That one's easier. Uh, so. So the things I'm going to go over today are architecture, uh, the architecture of the extensions, some mistakes I've made during my development process, and also uh, some of uh, the improvements that, uh, that can be made or I have made to my existing extensions. So I hope that, uh, I, like, I know some of these moments are going to be kind of cringe and some of you guys are going to be like, why did I do make that decisions? But the thing is, it's like when you're making, do when you're working on stuff, it's just, you know, create, it's just a process of creation, it's, it's use whatever technologies you, what you're comfortable with, and just, you know, enjoy it, and just build stuff, you know, and build things that you want, and sometimes you'd be surprised uh, who else wants to use that extension, too. Uh, so, yeah, so just to cover what extensions are, extensions are just essentially just uh, simple little web pages that are trapped on the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they're just little web pages trapped in iframes on the Twitch channel. You know, so people like they're not something sophisticated. 
<laughs> I'm getting I'm getting requests to, to add this on the Twitch dev documentation page that uh, we should uh, add this as a <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so uh, the very first extension I ever made uh, was the GitHub project extension this was back uh, when it was per first publicly released to, to us, us developers I asked myself um, what do I want and I was like you know what I want to show off my GitHub projects so why don't I just build an extension and that's what I did. So I built a panel extension. Uh, it displays your public repos. It integrates with the GitHub API, uses React.js, and it's powered by uh, Firebase uh, Cloud Functions and Firestore. So you're gonna see a lot of this, no, no AWS, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so uh, a brief overview of the architecture. So as a streamer, you come in and you go to the dashboard and uh, you, it, it does some requests to the COD functions and, and it, it queries the, fire, our, the Firestore, the database, and sees if you're set up already. If you're not, it'll ask you to put in your GitHub information, and then it will communicate with the, the GitHub API, where then it'll fetch your information and you can do the setup. On the viewer side, what happens is that it'll do a request, another request to the COD function, and it will just fetch everything out of the store and then present that to the user, so fairly straightforward. So. It's a fairly straightforward uh, interface or architecture, but like, how can you improve on this using existing Twitch APIs? Enter in the extension configuration segment. So when you go to the documentation and you read this, let's read it verbatim. So it <laughs> sets a single configuration segment, any type, segment type is uh, specified by a required body parameter. Each segment is limited to five kilobytes and can be set at at most 20 times per minute. Updates to this data are not delivered to the extensions that have been already rendered. So, in layman's terms, this is a data store. This is a storage for you to use on Twitch that Twitch has provided you. You don't have to pay anything to use this. This is a database. And in certain sense, we can treat it like a NoSQL database. You can just throw strings up there and then, you know, format it whatever you want. So, equipped with this knowledge, what could we do with the GitHub project extension? Get rid of Firestore. Boom, get rid of Firestore, exactly. So we got rid of Firestore and now we can use the configuration segment. Um, unfortunately, we still have to kind of use the cloud functions because we have to, because the GitHub API is authenticated, so we can't just directly throw data in there. We needed to use a secret key for that information. So now that we have our data stored in the configuration segment, how is the viewer side gonna look? Boom, now, when the channel page loads and it fetches information, I'm like totally distracted with it, like the thing. <laughs> um, it just does it queries directly to the configuration segment. So no longer do we need the cloud function or the fire store. Now we can just query directly to Twitch, to Twitch API and get uh, data out. So what are the improvements for the GitHub project extension? So we, using this uh, knowledge that we've equipped it, we can actually eliminate the fire store completely in favor of the extension configuration segment, and then potentially uh, eliminate uh, requests to our function, and the bonus is we save money, or I save money. <laughs> yeah, I still need to do this, by the way. <laughs> All right, so the second extension I built is the better information panel. So it's a panel and video component. It supports tabs, so it's basically like the panels below, your, below the stream, but it's like on steroids where it supports tabs, you can do like, you know, it has like markdown, mar uh, a markdown preview and like changing colors and tab titles and stuff like that. It's built with React, uses Firebase, Cloud Functions, and Firestore. The, AP, the API architecture for this is really straightforward. Um, it just, a view streamer goes to the dashboard and then goes to the Cloud Function, stores that information in Firestore, and then on the viewer side, it does the same thing, does a request to, the, to a function, fetches from the Firestore. Now, now we've talked about the configuration segment, the improvements we can make on that is, boom, we can completely actually eliminate the need for APIs or the Firestore because when they're setting things up, we can directly just store that information into the segment. So now the improvement to that is, the benefit is that we just completely eliminated the need for backend. Uh, we completely eliminated the need for a database. And actually, this extension ends up just costing me no money because we're, we're not doing any authenticated requests to third-party APIs. We're just storing data into a store that Twitch is providing us. 
So the, the lesson learned from this is that you might, not, you might be able to eliminate your database and even some of your function calls by just using the configuration segment uh, that, that, um, that exists that Twitch is offering. So you know, if, you, if you are planning to build an extension or, or already have one, you should try checking this out and to uh, you know, optimize your APIs or save some money. On to the next uh, extension, and this one's gonna be a little more interesting. So the streaming extension that I built is uh, a panel extension and the objective is to display either your Twitch team, if you're part of a Twitch, Twitch team, or if, you're like, or if you're an affiliate like myself at the time, you're not part of a team because you're not, privy, you're not privileged enough. So you can build your own team. Uh, and uh, this was built using React and again, Firebase Cloud Functions and the Firestore. So the architecture to this was uh, a little, you know, similar to the GitHub Projects API where we, uh, the, the streamer sets up some information about either the Twitch team that they're on or uh, automatically fetch the Twitch team that they're on, or they can configure their own custom team with title and, and users, and that would uh, communicate with the Twitch API and then store that into Firestore. So I'm making a very clear distinction of the mistake I started to make. I stored all the information about the teams and the users into my database. I thought I was getting clever, you know, by caching all this information, you know, I had not too many requests to the Twitch API, so I started doing that. So then on the viewer side, when it starts fetching information, uh, it goes, it, you know, when they, when they load the page, it goes to the function, queries the Firestore. Sometimes it'll query the Twitch API because there's a feature we'll go over in a second about, you know, clearing, clearing cache and up refreshing data. And it fetch all that information and store that into the Firestore again. So that wasn't a good idea. So, so here's what, so I wanted to break it down exactly what happens and this, you know, I thought it, this would be kind of enlightening. So uh, the client is a user that's visiting the channels page. They do a request, it hits the EBS, in this case, a cloud function. It does a query to the Firestore and then it double checks, hey, do I need to refresh my cache because, you know, you know, Twitch teams, user information changes, you know, you, you know, you, you know, you can change your chat, you can change your handle, you can change the teams, the contents of your team, you know, you can just get rid of someone, add someone to the team. Uh, refreshes that information, stores it on, and then sends that back to the user. And then I thought, I thought a, like a really cool feature would be like, ah, you know, what, why doesn't my panel just show who's live on the team? Is that really cool? You know, you can scroll down and see who's live. So like, you know, I implemented this kind of like polling mechanism on the UI where it, it requests to the function about getting a live list, you know, getting, requesting the people that are live, queries Firestore, double checks the refresh, refreshing the cache, which um, I think the cache was also five minute timer and uh, checks who's live, stores all that information, and then, respond, and then sends that request back. So this section right here ended up being a problem for me. Um, so one thing you have to know about using uh, databases as a service, not like Postgres or anything like that, is that they build by the size of the storage and data coming in and out. Um, you know, I'm doing uh, polling every five minutes, uh, you know, during a query. Um, Firestore contains a lot of information about the users, a lot of information about the teams. And, um, you know, I'm doing this for every single channel viewer. So, you know, like there are thousands of viewers, you know, in a channel. Uh, let me just say that once I implemented this, costs skyrocketed. And so I immediately turned this off. <laughs> so whenever a polling request came through, uh, I just returned back at 200 saying, hey, yeah, it, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I, I came back and I'm like, okay, well, we need to work on a 2.0. Um, so instead, so enlightened with some information about how better to use uh, the data, what I ended up doing is, again, uh, the, the client ends up doing a request to this function where we query from the Firestore, but this time I optimize it so I'm just storing simple IDs. Whatever team that they're on, I store their ID. And if they're doing a custom team, I need to store, I need to remember who the, the, the user IDs are for those. I just send those back and then I let the client do the request. So instead, I request uh, from the client on the UI, I do a request to Twitch API and fetch all that information before loading and displaying it to you. And then for the live feature, I was able to enable that because now that the UI knows 
who the team is, who the, who the people on the team are, I can just do simple requests to the Twitch API and do requests. And this, you're not gonna get rate limited because this is uh, the, the rate limit, it's based off each client. So it doesn't, even though your client ID, even though it's doing requests all over your client ID, it's spread across all these users that are using your extension. So you don't have to worry about that. That's originally the mistake I made with assumptions on the Twitch API. So, my costs <laughs> went down. It went down from dollars a day to uh, one cent a day, maybe, maybe, depending on peaks. <laughs> that makes, uh, it makes sense, I get it. <laughs> so yeah, so mistakes and improvements that I made to this team extension. So I stored way too much data. Um, you can leverage, you can delegate some of that work to the client, especially if you're working with the Twitch API and you're dealing with the APIs that don't require secret keys. Why don't you just have the client do the request for that information for you? Um, there, another improvement is I saved a load of money. Um, at, before I turned off the live polling thing, I was upwards, I was trending at $20 and keep on going. And now this, co now this costs me cents on the dollar. From the dollar. I don't know and then, and then, yeah, so, and then the bonus thing about this was that I ended up solving the stale data problem because as everyone knows, you know, when you're trying to cache data on the database, you'll come across stale data. But now that the client is in charge of fetching that information, I no longer have to deal with the stale data problem that some people were at emailing me about like, hey, you know, why isn't, why am I on the Twitch team? So that actually ended up being a bonus to solving this with this new implementation of the workflow. So yeah. Paint to issue cost at scale, regardless, uh, in regards to your data usage. And uh, because things that make it crazy, because you know, it's like, yeah, you're using the cloud function, you're not you're using like, a, like Azure functions, AWS function, like Lambda functions, whatever, but pay attention to the other services you're using. I didn't do that, and I paid the price for that, literally. Uh, so yeah. So yeah, so the last extension, and I flipped this because the slides didn't fit very well with all the text, so this is why it's kind of like off-center and stuff like that. So, so this, is like, this is like my baby, but based off all the, all the lessons learned, I, this is the extension that I built for the last, not this current dev jam, but the last dev jam. Um, I was inspired by Noopcat herself uh, about building a, a, stream, uh, a closed captioning extension. So yeah, so th this extension is a video overlay and panel, uh, panel extension that actually offers closed captioning on your stream. It adds an overlay on, and you can uh, do closed captioning. Uh, it's built with React.js. It uses AWS Elastic Beanstalk, Progress DB, uh, Redis Cache, and then uses a speech-to-text JavaScript API that um, Chrome offers for free. So the users are restricted to using Chrome for this because they offer it for free. And then it, and then I enabled. Uh, I recently uh, released uh, translations using Azure Bit-enabled translations, and and uses the configuration service that we uh, configuration settings that we talked about before for user settings. And then also uses the PubSub API that Twitch offers for broadcasting to all the channels for multi-tenant support. Uh, so the overall architecture is this. Um, so on the bottom left is the broadcaster. They're on the website, on the companion website, enabling uh, go on Chrome, turning on uh, speech to text. From there, it sends a message. It takes all the text that's happening on the browser, on the browser side, send that information to, over to the server through Elastic Beanstalk where it handles the load balancing to EC2. And then and do, I do some Redis caching, some storing on the Postgres database if you want to do transcripts, and like there's user data because like you have to actually log in, so I'm authenticating requests. And then from there, I am publishing that information to uh, Twitch itself. So Twitch, so I'm publishing the messages to Twitch using their PubSub API, and uh, any new settings that they do. I recently released, uh, in honor of International Pirate Day, I, introduced, I, I released um, Pirate Talk Mode, uh, so like it, I, I, it converts all your English to pirate lingo. So when you say what, it says shiver me timbers. Uh, uh, yeah, so it, it publishes all the information. And then on the client side, when viewers are watching the stream, they get that information coming from Twitch, not from my servers. So yeah, so I thought this is kind of a cool diagram to kind of show like the overall architecture of it. So on the broadcaster turns on the closed captioning at the top. The dashboard UI connects to your mic, starts listening to your to whatever microphone you're using for your streaming, and then it go, and then every one, every second it sends uh, the speech to text information to uh, to my server. It does it every second because the PubSub API is limited to one one publish a second. So one thing to note if you if you want to use this API, 
It does some logic here in the boxes about enabling bit translations, so um, it listens to transactions, it, it determines whether it needs to deduct from your bit balance, and then, act and then if you are doing translations, it will then uh, do a request to Azure, where the service I'm using to do translations, and this actually, and I'm able to do this in line because Azure actually returns back in like 10 milliseconds the text that it's being translated. And right now it supports four languages. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, and then from there we send the, I publish out the payload to uh, Twitch. And then Twitch, it's, and then Twitch is responsible for getting that payload to all the users on various streams. And, um, and then the only thing that actually hits my server is when the client actually wants to uh, triggers uh, bits. Uh, does a bitch purchase, uh, my, the client actually does a request to my server to, to, to say like, hey, you know, like someone just purchased uh, translations and, you know, and they, you know, do, do all the lingo to, to, to enable it. So yeah, so this is kind of like my baby and like I took out all the, all the mistakes I made. So there's not many things that I can think about improving on it right now. Um, one thing that I can potentially use is that the, they've, they released, uh, Twitch released a WebSocket for transactions. So instead of sending a post request to my server to, to get no notifications about transactions, I can instead uh, listen to a WebSocket and then process that, process that potentially. Um, and one other thing that I didn't think about that I actually just found out the other day looking at the Twitch dev Discord was that maybe I, I could actually use the local storage on the browser potentially to uh, store the uh, closed captioning messages that are coming in to do some more creative things. And, because right now all I'm doing is just concatenate into one giant string, which is, I, I felt like was inefficient. So maybe I can put all those strings that are, all those published uh, new strings that are coming in from into the local storage and using that instead. So that's one potential improvement I can make. So, I just want to say, like, you know, take a look at the documentations, regardless of what you guys think about it, <laughs> think of them, uh, that, you know, there are great APIs for them. It, sometimes they're hard to read, but there are things for you to use on there to make <laughs> There are really great things there. Like, they're, like the Twitch, the dev teams made a lot of great uh, APIs and things for you to use to, to, to make your extension great. Uh, you just got to look at, you just got to go on the Discord or just ask for help, you know, <laughs> if you're not sure. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and last of all, we've got uh, Bryce or Bressy, um, an admin from the forums again and uh, from the Discord, and he's doing his talk on why your extension won't work. Uh, so I'll hand it over to him. Uh, I don't know, but I need to stop it. Uh, can I use the mouse at the same time? Or sure, it's gonna be Do you want to use speaker notes or no? Uh, no, it's just to, to start the video and stop it. Yeah, do you need notes? No, no, I'm fine with it. Okay, everyone, so today I will do, do a small talk about why your Twitch extension is not working. And there is already a spoiler, it can be fixed, okay? <laughs> I, don't you. Uh, I will prove you wrong, okay? <laughs> so first of all, uh, I'm Bressy. Um, so I'm a full stack developer and I work uh, in a company called Lonestone. This is a small game studio and I do web programming there. And I'm a former student at Gobelin École de l'Image in France, in Paris, uh, which is basically where I did uh, interactive programming. So it's a mix of um, programming and design. So I might have a bit a different approach from some more technical people. Um, I've been making extension on Twitch for like one year and chatbot and stuff for like three years. Uh, right. 
concerning extension, I have two extensions published right now. Uh, live request and quest. Uh, the name are similar, but they do different things. Um, I also publish uh, one boilerplate, which is a Vue.js and Node. Yeah. I, I will do React soon, but. Uh, uh, this would be the subject on another talk, OK? And also, I recently published a package for Vue and Vuex to abstract the JS helper on extensions to have everything reactive. You don't worry about setting up everything, anything. It just does its magic on behind. So you don't worry about how it's working. And I'm one of the moderator on Twitch Dev. Um, and Twitch Dev for uh, Discord and the channel too. So if you got banned there, it might be me. <laughs> and I will disappoint some of you there. I won't go technical, so I won't look at your code today and everything. So for this, you can join the Discord. <laughs> so what are Twitch extensions? Um, there is three kind of extension. As it was mentioned before, there are web pages that live in an iframe. But I will explain what are the different kinds, because it's, it's quite important to get your extension working. Um, so the first kind is panels extension. These are the most commonly used. You can see them in the description. So for example, this one is from Streamlabs. And it just show when the stream will be live or not. So it's pretty convenient to give information that they are not directly related to the content of the stream. Next, you have video components. So I advertise my own extension here. And so these extensions live in the sidebar on the side of the stream. Uh, they can be open or closed by the viewers. You don't display them by default. So they have to be a bit linked to the stream, but they, are, they don't have to be there all the time because the only one can be displayed at the same time, and they are off by default. Then you have video overlays. These are displayed by default and can take up or the full screen. So they are more or less the best integration you can do, but they will require the more work. So this one is one of the most commonly used is the um, uh, earthstone.deck tracker, which allows you to simply see the cards on the earthstone game, what is being played, and their effects which is quite useful when you don't know the game at all, or you haven't played in a year, and you're like, what the hell is this new card? So to give a simple example of why, of why this is important, this is the first version of my extension live request. So live request allows, you, allows streamers to set up custom requests that can be asked by the viewers in exchange of bits or just during the stream. The first version was during it was on a panel. The problem is the content of the request is linked to the content of the stream. So people had to scroll down on the description and lose the focus of the stream. So what I did was simply to move it to a video component. Now they can still watch what is happening, but they know exactly what what is related to what in the stream. And that's quite important when you look at it, because um, I had almost like two months without any activation on live request. Like seriously, it was zero, 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 zero every day before I made that change. The design is correct, but when, when you have functionality, something that works, that has a good design, but is on the wrong place, we, people will simply not use it. So maybe you have done a great work, but you are not in the right place. So think about it. Think about what the goal of your extension is for this. So I will have a, a small example. And this one is on my submission for the previous hackathon for Twitch on my other extension that's called Quest. Um, I will simply show you the video that I made to present the extension for the Akatan.
So that was the first version of the extension. Uh, I made it in two weeks and more or less programmed it in one week. Yeah. So can anyone guess what was the problem here? Uh, it, it, yeah, no, it, yeah, but it wasn't. It wasn't the problem here. Yeah, it, I don't, I'm not talking about the video. I'm talking about the extension. <laughs> hey, I did it in one night before the submission. <laughs> No, uh, uh, the dark thing <laughs> is not on the on the extension. You only on the extension. You only see this. <laughs> Don't worry, it's for the video. The problem was not the video. It was mostly uh, try to guess what, why the extension did not work. Uh, not technically, but for streamers. Not really. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not a problem. Uh, streamers, for to update minorly, it was a, not a problem. One last. It doesn't look like there's like a free tier and we are on the closest one here. And basically, the problem was bits. As you can see, I talk about bits. And I will show you what I earned with bits in five months, which is $1.40. So why was it a problem? So as you can see, they earned nothing. And they were comp making the ar architecture super complex. The configuration uh, page was like two thirds of the configuration were for bits. And streamers just didn't care. Viewers didn't care. I thought it was a good idea to engage viewers. And as you can see, mm, almost all of you didn't solve the problem here, too. So sometimes some features can, are, uh, can be really useless instead of, being, of creating content for the core experience of your extension. Here I lost money, I lost time, and users. So sometimes really try to talk with streamers what they use your extension for. Like the simple tip I have for this is to use the endpoint on the API to see who is live using your extension, and just go to the stream and talk to the streamers and ask them what they are doing, and all they like the extension, and the viewers too, like both of them. Not just the streamer, not just the viewer, both of them. It's quite important. And then when you are, when, when you are your extension ready, you have to present it and more or less sell it to other people. So the first thing is the discovery image. So you have this, uh, this store on Twitch where all the extensions are listed, and you have to more or less stand out of the, of the mass of extensions. I've, I don't know how many there are, but we are maybe around 400, I think. So yeah. So this is, again, Quest. This is the first discovery image for Quest. Great, isn't it? Uh, it was made like the night before the, the deadline of the Akaton with my super talents in art. So, yeah. And basically, it was not engaging. No one was clicking on it and, and stuff. So, like a few months later, I talked with a friend and we went to do this instead. So, basically, the, it, it's way more engaging now, and it's not ugly anymore, and people click. It creates curiosity, and I saw an improvement of at least 50% of clicks just to go to visit the page of the extension. 
So then when you have clicks, you have more people installing and stuff like this. So sometimes all you present your extension is quite important too, unless you don't want people to use it. <laughs> and then you have another page to present it. It's, it's when they click on the discovery image, they arrive here. So you have image on the side. I won't talk about it here because there is a lot of things to say about it, but there was a great article on the Twitch blog on tips to, uh, I think it's nine, nine months of features of you to have on your extension that talks about it, especially like using GIFs and, and stuff like this. I will talk about the description. Uh, this is the last description of my extension live request. Uh, at first, it was basically a huge block of text. So it's quite a problem. At first, it was because we could not go use new lines and descriptions. It got solved, so that's great. And, and one thing in, that is quite important, emojis. It sounds dumb, but emojis are great to highlight features. You can't use bold or italics in descriptions. So what I did with live request is really structure uh, everything using emojis and stuff. For example, you get the features, uh, the notification system, and even a link to a Discord where I engage my community with it. And I saw a huge conversion in, in installation because of this, because people knew directly what the extension was doing, and they did not have to read a big chunk of text. That's boring. So, and after the release, like basically you have done your presentation, your extension is working. Well, test your code, please. <laughs> I learned it the hard way. Uh, I would say like it was in January, my extension uh, live request got featured and there was a bug. So I was in the front page of the store and there was a quite important bug bug, and it took me five days, because review is not instant, to get it fixed. So it was on Monday, the next week. I basically lost one week of feature, and the feature on the front page lasts one week. So please test your code, or you basically are sending first a wrong image of your extension, and you can lose a lot of opportunities. And sometimes streamers don't know this is a bug and they don't know how to report it because sometimes they don't read. And to allow them to report the bugs, just tell them what to do. Like on my extension live request, I basically gave them my Twitter, uh, an email, and the Discord that is on the description. So they know where to go and where to ask questions if they have problem. Like I will have someone arriving every week or two weeks asking if they can do this or this on, the ex on one extension. And uh, at the same time, I'm building a small community of streamers on my own Discord. So if I need people to test features, I can ask them. If I need some uh, advice or point different point of view, I can just ask and just do a ping at everyone and get yelled at. But that's for a good reason. So that's it for me. If some of you have questions, not technical one, and for this, go to the Discord. You can ask them quickly. Uh, basically, I have tabs on, on the top, and there is a contact support. Can you repeat the question? Hmm? Can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. Uh, the question was, where was placed um, the contact me? Uh, information on the extension. It's on the configuration page, and there is tabs on the top, and they can just go to support and help. So um, they can just click there. It's pretty flashy on the top, so they know. Uh, so code coverage for extension, like uh, browser coverage and retro. Um, I'm one of the kind that doesn't care that much, because, uh, like for example, I don't support Internet Explorer, um, and I only support recent navigators for sim because also we are on Twitch. 
we are not like doing websites for uh, old companies that are doing things the old way. Most of the users keep their navigators updated or have recent version at least. Um, to get feedback from users, um, uh, most of the time I simply go to the endpoint on the NPI to see who is live, and I just join the chat, say hi, and, and I talk a bit, and after some time I say, hey, I'm a developer of the extension, and ask for what they think about it. And also, with the Discord, I can talk to streamers directly. And honestly, I got some streamers that have been using my s extensions for like maybe eight months. And one of the reasons is not because they are the best, is because I talk with streamers. They are like, okay, we are people listen to me. They take the I, I matter I matter to the to the developer, so they feel important, and it's part of basically most of them are trying to make a living out of streaming. So they feel supported. So for error reporting and things like this, I should have, but I haven't. <laughs> but yeah, like uh, it's it can be useful, but also most of the time when you do. Good testing, it will help a lot. But like I do, my backend is on AWS, so I also get the error reporting there. Um, so for activation on video overlays, I can't really talk because I haven't made one. So the components, um, I would say on a, for activation, then it's they really need to see what it will bring to their stream because we are taking space visually on their stream. We are not just a small thing that they will add and stuff. We are literally, literally taking place on the stream, on their content. So we need to add a value to them. So very clear call to action. Uh, call to action, it needs to be quick. They don't have, they don't, uh, streamers don't need to explain the extension over and over and over because it will make them lose time and time is important for them. Hmm. Yes. They are removed, and it, so I remove all the backend. Hmm? Oh, yeah. So the question was about bits. And in the extension, uh, quests uh, that were useless, so I removed them. So what front end do I use uh, for the web is Vue.js. Uh, basically, I use Vue.js for pragmatic reason because I'm more proficient with it than in React or Angular, jQuery, jQuery, or anyone or anything else, and because it allowed me to really quickly prototype with reactive data and stuff. So, but here, it's really a matter of per what you are good at, what you like to do. So, just do what you like. You can do ex extensions with whatever you want. So, yeah. So, thank you. To and that's basically it for the evening. Um, if there's any food left over, grab some food. If there's any beer, grab some beer. Um, there are some caps left, so if you didn't get one when you actually arrived, or a bag, come, come and see me, I'll just grab you one. Um, and I just want to say thanks to Blink again and Brent uh, for the host. I'll just wait, hang on. <laughs> um, Twitch for the catering and uh, Whole Health Catering for the lovely food. Uh, I will try some.
I, I did say it's lovely. I will try it first. Um, and then uh, thanks to everyone who's helped organize this, like Eric and everything else. And thanks to everyone for being here. It's been absolutely amazing. Um, hopefully next year we'll do it again. All right. Bye for now, guys. Thank you very much. So we're here for another hour and a half or so, so we'll put the music back on. Also, our studio is meant for you to roam around, so if you're interested in about our work with Oculus, Nintendo, Atari, lots of other companies, uh, you can talk to the folks who work for Blink, which would be the people not wearing TwitchCon badges. Uh, yeah, so anywhere that you, can, that, that you see that's not like locked or, or clearly got a barrier, please roam and explore. Uh, and ask us around, ask around questions and get some more to drink. Yeah, upstairs is totally cool. And then there's like, there's another room over there with workshop activities like Matt was talking about earlier. We can, we can show you some stuff that's like going on right now uh, and give you some more context if that's interesting to you. If not, hang out outside and drink. Yeah. Thanks again for joining us.